Good evening, and welcome to Counterculture with Danielle D'Souza Gill. The culture's gone crazy, media's gone mad, and reason has become repugnant. Here, we focus on facts and how to fight back. Tonight, we'll be discussing the government's corrupt role in unreliable news stories, everything from Ukraine to the Durham report to COVID and more. We'll also speak with independent journalist Sarah Carter about these topics. One of the biggest and most profoundly influential lies of our current time is that our news media is independent and that one of their major goals is to keep the public informed. This is manifestly not the case. We've talked about how all news media is majority owned by only a handful of corporations, but this is only one small part of the overall scandal. Another major facet, which is not as frequently discussed, is the extent to which these same media outlets are either beholden to or just active collaborators with national governments. We've seen bits and pieces of this system of government control recently. The Twitter files, for instance, revealed how the government used back and social media access to censor and control the national conversation on a whole host of topics. This included everything from the 2020 election to COVID vaccine side effects. More recently, we've seen outlets such as PBS and NPR rage quit Twitter after Elon Musk's company tagged them as government-funded media, which is so true. It's no secret that taxpayer money funds these outlets, so their reaction to this inarguably accurate tag comes across as way overly sensitive. The more media savvy have also noticed that certain ostensibly private media outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post have curiously strong relationships with certain sectors of permanent Washington. And particularly, the Times serves as a dutiful clearinghouse for leaks from the FBI and the Department of Justice, while the Washington Post serves as a mouthpiece for the CIA and its cover organization, the Department of state. Because of these close ties and deep working relationships, neither of these news outlets have published anything that can be considered reliably newsworthy for a good many years, and certainly not independent. At best, you have to take what they publish with a grain of salt, and at worst, you have to recognize their copy as the latest form of psychological manipulation and all-out information indoctrination against the American people. This is why the story of the 2023 Pentagon leak has always been highly suspect. It was the New York Times that broke the story in the mainstream, publishing scandalous details that reveal the rather unremarkable fact that our government lies to her boss, the American public, almost as a matter of policy. The leaks revealed that the Ukraine war has been going quite badly for the Ukrainians, with some estimates showing four Ukrainians killed for every Russian casualty. The document also leaked plans for a springtime counteroffensive at a very opportune time for the Russian military to build up their own forces. Then there is the fact that the government has been hiding our troop presence in Ukraine. Though small in number, the fact of their presence alone makes our country an active participant in a ground war against a major nuclear power. These details directly contradict what our own Pentagon representatives have submitted as sworn testimony before Congress. There are also details concerning other countries, such as Israel, where documents reveal that Mossad is behind the popular uprising against Prime Minister Netanyahu's judicial reforms. Or that Egypt, one of our closest allies in the Middle East, is secretly sending weapons to Russia. As embarrassing as these details are, you still have to leave room for doubt given that the major outlets behind the reporting were the New York Times and the Washington Post. And as if to underscore that need to doubt, both the Times and the Post stepped up to help the FBI track down the suspected leaker. This shocked journalist Glenn Greenwald, who noted that a media outlet serving as a government enforcer is an inversion of what journalism is supposed to be all about. He also pointed out that by sensationally focusing on suspected leaker Jack Texera, they had effectively moved the story away from the damaging content of the leaks to the man facing charges for leaking the documents. Even worse, much of the media rhetoric surrounding the leak has been to frame the argument so that the government needs to do more to censor and control the internet. In case that isn't creepy enough for you, the Post and the Times did the heavy lifting for the FBI with a third partner, the self-described independent collective of researchers known as Bellingcat. 
Although Bellingcat proudly declares they do not accept government funding, they are still awash in government funds. One of their biggest nonprofit contributors in 2020 was the National Endowment for Democracy, an ostensibly private run foundation, which, according to Influence Watch, is, quote, almost entirely funded by the U.S. Congress, end quote. In other words, government funding with extra steps. Bellingcat also claims the money they take from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe doesn't count as government money in their book because it's a supranational organization. This group gets its name from the tale of mice who thwart a cat by tying a bell around its neck so they always know where the cat is. Given their role as a co-enforcer of the DC establishment, Apparently, they see whistleblowers in the same way that mice see cats. Bell and Cat is also unique in that they are not a traditional news outlet, but a supposed experimentation in crowdsourcing investigative research with an emphasis on open sources. Open source research, also known as OSINT for open source intelligence, is simply finding whatever you can online, usually for free. It involves sneaking into social media to scour for photos or statements or anything incriminating for that matter. And as far as that is concerned, Bellingcat is not the only game in town. After January 6, 2021, a similar ad hoc group of supposedly civic-minded Austinters, who called themselves the Sedition Hunters, also gathered to execute their plan of running down every protester caught on camera anywhere around the Capitol that day. Their work also involves delving into social media to dox and reveal personal details to the FBI in order to arrange for a special visit at the suspect's home address. There are numerous references in court filings by the DOJ crediting the sedition hunters for their help. While they claim to be volunteers, the members of the sedition hunters are also anonymous. This is problematic for many reasons. Every person facing trial in D.C. knows the names of their judge, the prosecuting attorney, and even special agents who investigated them. But they don't get to know the names or backgrounds of the sedition hunters' informants. And if the identity of these accusers are unknown to even the FBI, then there can be no assurance or accountability that the sedition hunters include among their ranks members of another group known as InfraGuard. Who are InfraGuard? They are private sector volunteers who offer their services to help the FBI do specialized research. This research naturally includes OSINT research. So we have two groups of private citizens that both volunteer the same type of OSINT investigative services to the FBI for the same reason of helping them prosecute their mission. No one is asking if these two organizations are either de facto or by default the same thing, but they should be. Wow, the FBI sure needs a lot of help these days. What do you get taxpayer money for again? Between NPR, PBS, The Times, The Post, Bellingcat, Sedition Hunters, and InfraGuard, it seems the government has no shortage of mouthpieces, ciphers, and informants to do the dirty work for them. From establishment media to more untraditional volunteer and crowdsourced outlets, it's clear that you can't rely on an outlet's age, format, funding, or lack thereof, to know if it's reliably a good source or independent. The dark upshot of all of this is the fact that at every stage of information dissemination, we have hard evidence of the government interfering in the process with the explicit intention of covering up its own crimes and deliberately misleading the public. An independent press is important to a properly functioning democracy. Voters who aren't truthfully informed will not be able to make the right decision when it comes time to vote. So what we end up with is a government that avoids all accountability by directly subverting democracy at the informational level. Their methods range from brute force, like censorship, to more sophisticated forms of dissembling and manipulation. This means our media is not just unreliable, it is downright adversarial.